three persons got on Cyclone, the horse would rear up and plunge its head down to throw the rider. Cyclone acted as though it would topple over backwards, but three persons hung on. Then it hurled itself forward with its head almost touching the ground. After a wild ride of several minutes, Cyclone began to tire. The judges declared Tom three persons the winner of the Bucking Bronco event. Three Persons was the only Canadian to win a major event at that first Calgary Stampede in 1912. Today, the Calgary Stampede continues to be the largest rodeo and Wild West show in North America. It has many new events and attractions and still attracts the best rodeo riders from all over North America. The Expulsion of the Acadians The history of the Americas, from their discovery by Columbus to the founding of modern nation-states, has been the struggle among European powers for the largest and richest sections of the continents. In particular, England and France have struggled for control of most of North America. Many tragedies and disasters have marked this conflict, but few have been as heart-rendering as the expulsion of the Acadians in 1755. Acadia refers to what are now the maritime provinces of Canada, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia. In 1605, a French expedition under De Mont and Champlain established an agriculture settlement at Port Royal in present-day Nova Scotia. Although Port Royal and other colonies had very mixed success, there was a gradual increase of French settlement through the 17th century. By 1710, the French or Acadian population had reached 2,100. In 1710, Port Royal fell to the English, and the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 confirmed British ownership of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. By this treaty, the Acadians, that is the French-speaking inhabitants, were allowed to stay or leave the country as they pleased. The majority of inhabitants of Acadia were French and were still being influenced by agents from France and Quebec. This made their loyalty to Britain very doubtful in time of war. Governor Phillips attempted to get the Acadians to swear an oath of allegiance to King George of England, and Phillips was able in 1729 to get the French settlers to agree to a modified oath with the understanding that they would not have to fight against the French and their Indian allies. The Acadians remained neutral during the fighting between Britain and France in 1744-45 to in Nova Scotia. In 1749, the British established a new capital for Nova Scotia at Halifax and began to bring in English-speaking settlers. Because of threats from the French and Indians, most of these settlers remained close to Halifax. British skirmishes with the French and Indians continued, and a new war between France and England was approaching. Governor Lawrence decided that it was time to settle the Acadian question. He ordered the Acadians either to take an unqualified oath of allegiance to England or to face expulsion from the colony. At that time, in 1755, there were troops and ships from New England in the area, and it seemed like an opportune time to round up the Acadians and ship them out. When the Acadians refused to take the oath which might oblige them to fight against France, the British rounded up 6,000 of the 8,000 Acadians, burned their homes, and shipped them away to British colonies of Virginia, the Carolinas, and as far away as the mouth of the Mississippi River. Several of the transport ships sank, drowning all on board, and the Acadians died from disease and hardship. Since the expulsion order did not come from London, it has been suggested that Governor Lawrence had personal reasons for the expulsion. He may have been greedy for the land and possessions confiscated from the Acadians. Others say there was the genuine fear for the English position in North America and that Lawrence was only protecting the interests of the colony. Acadians still live in maritime Canada today. Almost 2,000 fled into the woods and looted the roundup. Another 2,000 Acadians later returned from exile to take the oath of allegiance. Many stories were told of their sufferings. One tale relates to how on the very day of his wedding, a bridegroom was seized by the British and transported from the colony. His bride wandered for many years through the American colonies trying to find him. At last, when she was old, she found him on his deathbed. The shock of finding him and his death soon caused her death. This is the story of Henry W. Longfellow's poem, Evangeline. The Florida Everglades Southern Florida stretches south, dividing the Atlantic Ocean from the Gulf of Mexico. Stretching further south is the Florida Keys. These coral islands are the southernmost part of the United States. Since much of southern Florida is close to sea level, it's very swampy. The famous Everglades are wetlands where tall grass and bunches of trees grow. Part of these swamps has been drained for agricultural land. The soil is rich, and market gardening is an important activity. The Everglades that remain are too wet to be used for farming. The Everglades are a river of grass. The deeper water areas stay wet all year, but the shallower pools dry up in the dry season. Some of the water has been drained off for agricultural purposes, making the Everglades drier. Nonetheless, the best way to travel in this region is by airboats. 
These high boats can go through water and sail over clumps of grass. Besides the wet grasslands, southern Florida has smaller areas of tropical forest. These areas of hardwood trees are called hammocks, and they are rich in animal and plant life. Along much of the coast are mangrove trees, which provide important nesting grounds for wild birds. The Florida Keys stretch 200 miles from Miami southwest. These islands are tropical in climate. Fishing and tourism are important industries. Because of its subtropical nature, the animal and plant life of southern Florida differs from other parts of the United States. Characteristic animals are alligators and crocodiles. Alligators prefer fresh water and usually live inland, while crocodiles live in salt water along the coast. Both animals are considered dangerous. Alligator wrestling is considered a sport for the brave or foolhardy. Probably Florida is the most famous for its birds. At one time, many species were almost extinct. Their long feathers were used on women's hats. Now the law protects them. Florida has at least six species of herons, several egrets, wood storks, white ibises, and cormorants. Characteristic Florida birds are the purple gallinule, the aninga, the limpkin, flamingos, and roseate spoonbills. Many of these birds are notable for their size, coloring, and interesting habits. Notable animals include the key deer, a miniature form of the white-tailed deer. There are also panthers or cougars, bobcats, marsh rabbits, mangrove squirrels, round-tailed muskrats, and the manatee. Naturally, the Everglades are home to many reptiles. Snakes are common, both water snakes and land species. There are four poisonous varieties. Both land and sea turtles abound, and lizards are fairly common. Fishing is a major industry. Sports fishermen go to sea in search of trophies such as marlin, sailfish, and tarpon. Smaller fish are caught commercially. Freshwater sport fish include bass and gar. After many decades of work to protect the animals and plants of the Everglades, the region finally became a national park in 1947. It is the third largest park in the USA and covers one and a half million acres. Within the park live 300 kinds of birds, 30 kinds of mammals, 65 kinds of reptiles and amphibians, and nearly 1,000 species of flowering plants. Of course, it is a major tourist attraction. The Great Walls of China the Great Wall of China is famous in North America, and many tourists would like to travel there. However, most North Americans don't know very much about Chinese history. That is changing now, as China is becoming an important subject for study in the West. The settled communities of China were targets for nomadic raids since earliest times. For much of its early history, China was not fully unified. However, Shi Wang, who died in 210 BC, united the whole country. Then he set about defending China from the northern nomads. It seems likely there have been defensive walls in the north before. However, Shi Wang had a wall constructed across the entire north of China. This defensive wall extended for almost 2,000 miles and had 25,000 towers. Such walls were very expensive to build. They also required huge numbers of men to construct them and later to defend them. Even so, the Great Wall did not stop nomadic invasions altogether. Not long after Shi Wang's death, a tribe called the Huns crossed the wall. The emperor, Hu Ti, who expanded Chinese power beyond the wall, defeated them. Centuries later, the Mongols to the north of China were united under Genghis Khan. The Mongols attacked China, and Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis, became the first non-Chinese emperor of China in 1279. Eventually, the Chinese rebelled and overthrew their Mongol rulers. Nonetheless, the Mongols remained a threat. In 1449, they destroyed a Chinese army and captured the emperor. A new Great Wall was begun to keep the Mongols out. This is the wall which tourists visit today and which is pictured on Chinese stamps. Construction continued for 200 years. While some parts were built off packed earth, much of the wall was built of stone, brick, and rubble. This is why it took so long. Stones had to be quarried and bricks baked and carried to the site. Laborers, peasants, soldiers, and criminals were forced to work on the wall. Large and small forts and watchtowers carefully guarded the wall. Nearly a million soldiers were stationed along it. The Chinese defenders lit fires when the enemy was sighted. Plumes of smoke and cannon shots told that the enemy was advancing and how many there were. By 1644, the new wall was almost completed. That same year, however, an internal uprising overthrew the emperor. This revolt was partly caused by the high taxes demanded to pay for the wall. The emperor's men invited the nomadic Manchu tribe to come through the gates in the wall to help put down the revolt. The Manchus came, but they stayed and ruled China for several hundred years. Since the Manchus ruled both north and south of the wall, they did not care about maintaining it. Many parts fell into disrepair. 
and some completely disappear. Today, the parts that remain are a major tourist attraction. The Great Wall of China is one of the wonders of the world, even if it really didn't succeed in its purpose of keeping the northern nomads out of China. The Internet The first working computers in the 1950s and 1960s were large mainframe machines. In some ways, they were like large calculating machines. The U.S. government, the military, and businesses and institutions used them for specific tasks. For example, they might be used to handle the payroll. As more uses were found for computers, the need to transfer data from one computer to another became a concern. In 1969, the U.S. government sponsored a program to explore ways for computers to transfer data over telephone lines. The first Internet was created with four computers linked together. Of course, computer use increased beyond anyone's expectations. Standards were developed that describe how data was to be transferred between computers. A common language for commands and communications emerged. Operating programs such as MS-DOS, Unix, Macintosh, and Windows came into existence. The Internet quickly expanded beyond government and military uses. The PC became the standard form of computer. Private agencies acted as hosts for Internet usage. Around 1982, there were 213 hosts. By 1986, there were 2,300. Today, there are millions. The role of computers expanded so quickly that the USSR, which had discouraged computer use, found itself left behind by the USA. Part of the reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 was that they had fallen too far behind the United States in high-tech areas to ever catch up. One of the most popular uses of the computer is electronic mail or email. You can send a letter by computer over the Internet to anywhere in the world in seconds or less, and it doesn't cost anything extra. Now data can be transferred great distances almost instantaneously. Another major Internet use is the World Wide Web. In the early days, all web pages were text only. In the 1990s, it became possible to make web pages interactive and multimedia. Interactive means that readers could click on items on the web page and get more information. They could also communicate directly with the web page owner. Multimedia means that web pages were no longer text only. They could also have graphics, film video, and audio. This has helped to turn computers into popular entertainment. Nowadays, people spend hours every day surfing the net. However, there are some problems. For some people, computers are addictive. Many businesses are trying to control employees using the net during working hours. Since the Internet includes just about every kind of information, not all of it is good. You can find directions on how to become a criminal or a terrorist. There are scam artists who want to cheat you out of money. There are also aggressive pornography salesmen, not to mention people who want to kill your computer with viruses. Since the Internet is not closely regulated, it's up to individual users to follow computer etiquette. Parents need to supervise their children's use of the net. Although the Internet has some disadvantages, many people see the net as one of the greatest invention of modern times. The Planetarium all around the world, stargazing is a popular activity. The night sky lit up with stars is one of the most impressive scenes in nature. Besides its natural beauty, people study the night sky for many reasons. Some believe that they can read the future in the stars. Others think that the stars influence the weather, while some people worship the stars and the planets. There is a problem with stargazing. If the night is cloudy, people on the ground cannot see the stars. Also, bad weather makes being outside at night uncomfortable. Besides, not everybody wants to stay up late at night. A planetarium is an ideal solution to all these problems. A planetarium is usually a large dome-covered building. It has seating like a theater. The program here is a star show. A special projector throws a picture of the night sky on the ceiling of the planetarium theater. Like a movie projector, the planetarium projector can show a constantly changing program. It can show how the stars look right now, how they looked thousands of years ago, and how they will look in the future. Planetariums can be both entertaining and educational. School children can go to learn about the nine planets of the solar system or about the various groupings of stars. Planetariums can teach you how to find the stars and planets yourself when you're out at night. There can also be dramatic showings about changes to the universe over time. This is also a way to view special phenomena like Halley's Comet, which only appears once in a lifetime. 
Planetarians can also show how ancient people view the skies. Shepherds living out under the sky imagined that groups of stars represented wonderful people and huge animals. Stories were told about these constellations. Sometimes the story explained how the people or animals became stars. For example, why Orion, the mighty hunter, is chasing Taurus the bull. Planetarians can project these figures on their screen. They can also speed up changes in the heavens. It takes about 28 days for the moon to travel through all its faces. Changes in the moon or in the sun can be shown easily. Planetarians can also show the sky the way it appears in another part of the world or the way it appeared on a famous historical occasion. Special heavenly phenomena, such as a meteor shower, can also be demonstrated. Things that appear only rarely in the real sky can be shown every night. A planetarian is usually concerned to put into special programs to keep its audience coming back. Since the heavens are always moving and changing, there is no shortage of ideas for programmers. Alexander Graham Bell the Victorian period was a time of many new inventions. Earlier discoveries such as the steam engine, the screw propeller, the power of electricity, and the possibility of sending messages along a wire were now applied to everyday life. Inventors such as Thomas Edison and Nicholas Tesla explored new methods for harnessing electric power. Some of the greatest discoveries were made by Alexander Graham Bell. Bell was born in Scotland in 1847. Both his father and grandmother taught speech methods and worked with deaf and dumb children. Alexander was also interested in this work, especially as his mother was almost deaf. Alexander's two brothers died of tuberculosis, and he himself contracted the disease. So his parents decided to leave Scotland for a drier, healthier climate.